One time, my wife Leslie and I had a chance to go see Fiddler on the Roof with a couple of families from the church, and we had a great time, great night, great play, environment, everything, and just really enjoyed it. And at the end of the play, I looked up and one of the guys was standing, clapping, with tears running down. And I thought that it was great, but he was moved. He was moved by the whole event. We all want to be moved. We all want to have moments where, man, we're full of passion, hope, love. Just We go on vacations to experience this. We attend movies or ball games. We go to concerts because we want to be moved. We want to, we want to be empathetic in the, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. We want to be energized by something that happened or, or saddened or, or scared. We just simply want to be moved. On well, the series Final Words, we get a glimpse into the last teachings of Jesus. And these teachings have moved disciples for thousands of years. They moved his disciples that day. And for the past 2,000 years, they've moved disciples and kept the movement of Christianity alive, kept it going. And they still move today. Now, here's some background on what's going on in Jesus' final words. Starting in John 13, chapter 1, it says that Jesus knew everything. He knew everything. He knew everything that was going to happen. He knew that he was going to go to the cross. He knew that it was going to be bad. That's probably a, uh, understated dramatically. He knew it was going to be horrific. He knew that Judas was going to betray him, that Peter would deny him. He knew that the disciples would be scattered. He knew that he would become, take upon the sins of the world so that you and I could be forgiven. And we see in this passage, Jesus' final words and how they can move us. There's been a lot of talk about who's the greatest, the, the term the goat, the greatest of all time. And there's a big debate about whether it's MJ or LeBron, or whether it's Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, Ken Griffey Jr. And then lately it's been, is it, it, Tom Brady the goat? Is he the greatest quarterback of all time? And I don't know who you think is the goat in those. You may not even care. But I want to tell you about the greatest of all time as far as being a servant. See, Jesus is the humble servant. He's the humble servant. He's the greatest of all time. Now, there's been a lot of great servants, and I, I can name some. Uh, Billy Graham, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa. And they're great servants. But the greatest servant of all time is Jesus Christ. He is the humble servant. Not a humble servant. He is the humble servant. And we get to see in this moment where he knows everything that's about to happen. He knows his future. He knows the present. And he does one of the most moving acts besides the cross. We read in John, it says, So Jesus got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin, and then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. And when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus said, you don't understand what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you shall never wash my feet. And sometimes we don't want... Jesus to wash us. But the truth is, is that we have to be washed by Jesus, this, the, Jesus, the symbol of baptism, being washed, being washed by his word, washed by his spirit. 
But Jesus said, unless I wash you, you don't belong to me. And then Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And then Jesus says, a person who is bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. We see in this moment, in this picture, that Jesus is the humble servant. Now I can read these words to you, but I'd rather just walk through it for just a second. It says, Jesus stood up and he grabbed a towel and he wrapped it around him. And he was going to take the form of a servant. See, in Jesus' day, people's feet were always dirty. If it, if it was dry, their feet were dirty. If it was wet, their feet were muddy. And they had servants or slaves that were assigned to wash people's feet when they walked in the door. As a matter of fact, in Jesus' culture, wives were to wash their husbands' feet. Children were to wash the feet of their parents. But Jesus takes the form of a servant, wraps a towel around himself, pours water into a basin, And then he begins to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that's wrapped around them. Whose feet did he wash? Judas, Peter, the disciples who all ran in fear. The Son of God became a servant. The Creator Wash the feet of the created. The one who never sent would wash the feet of sinners. One of his most moving acts besides the cross. See, Jesus is the humble servant. He's the greatest of all time. You say, how do you say that, Gary? How can you say that? I can say it because of where he came from. See, Jesus came from heaven to this earth humbled himself to be born like a, a human, to be a baby. Had all access, all abilities in heaven. No limitations to be limited here on this earth. Jesus is the greatest of all time because of where he was going. He was going to the cross. He was going to humble himself all the way to the cross. Jesus is the greatest servant of all time because he knew what his disciples would do. He knew that they weren't going to be there for him, that they were going to turn and run, that they were going to deny, they were going to betray. And still, he washes their feet. He's the greatest of all time. Jesus is not only the humble servant, Jesus is calling you and I to be a servant like Him. One time when I was in college, I was at this church. Our college had a, an event at this church, Southwest Christian Church. And at the event, as it was about to close, I saw the lead pastor there. His name was Jim Dyer. I didn't know him very well. I'd met him a few times. And he started cleaning up. I thought, that's odd. I hadn't seen many senior pastors clean up at that time, many lead pastors. And he was over there cleaning up, and I thought, well, I'll go help him. And I walked over there, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, if you want to be great, you got to serve. And you know what? We all want to be great. We all want to move people. We, we, want, to, we want to have these moments and, and experiences, and they come through being a servant life-changing events. See, Jesus calls us to serve. He doesn't just serve. 
he gives an example to us. Jesus says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow, to do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are no greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends a message. See, Jesus is calling I, you and I to wash people's feet because people are moved through service. People are moved when you and I serve because it is so countercultural that when you and I take the form of a servant, when we humble ourselves, put someone else first, meet their needs, then that's when they see Jesus. You see, people are moved. You and I are moved. When we serve, we become more like Christ. We look like Jesus. We start to act like Jesus. We start to be like Jesus. And it comes through serving. And then we get the ability through our service to draw other people to Jesus, to his message, to the hope and life change that's found in him. And these come a lot of times simply through acts of service. I love the phrase here where Jesus said, no one, no no one is greater than their master. No slave is greater than their master. But you know, sometimes we think we are, don't we? Now, we would never say it. We'd never say I'm greater than Jesus. But a lot of times when it comes to serving, we think, well, I hope somebody else does that. I'm busy. I don't have time. I don't really know them that well. They might just take advantage of me. And I want to reiterate to you that Jesus is calling us. It's not an option to wash feet. We're to wash feet. We're to take the form of a slave and wash and be servants. In Philippians, there's a scripture that Paul writes. It kind of just uh, summarizes and to me, it's one of the most moving passages in the New Testament. Paul writes, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Listen, it's, it's easy to preach and hard to do. Don't look out only for your own interest, but to take an interest in others too. And then he says this, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, what I just talked about, came down from heaven, humbled himself, became a man, went to the cross, and took the humble position of a slave and was being born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to a place and honor and gave him the name that is above every name, the greatest of all time, Jesus Christ, calling you and I. It's an invitation to greatness, not for our glory, but for his. An invitation to be like him. But it's more than an invitation. It's a call. It's a command. Listen, we've got to serve. We've got to be servants. It is who we are. Jesus is calling us, compelling us to serve like he does. Mother Teresa was serving one time and there were some reporters who had gathered around and all of a sudden a leper came up. And she put her arms around him. She started cleaning one of the wounds that was on him. And one of the reporters looked at her and said, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And she looked back and said, neither would I. See, there's a calling that's greater than money. When we say that we're going to follow Jesus, we follow him. He's a servant. We're servants. A servant's not greater than his master. We follow in his steps. Jesus is the most humble servant, the greatest servant of all time. He's inviting us, calling you and I to be servants, to serve our community so that people can be moved 
so that you and I can be moved to a place where we're more like Christ, so others can be moved to see Him for who He really is. But here's the last part about it. I'm blessed when I'm serve, when I serve. I'm blessed when I serve. That scripture in John 13, 17 says, now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. He doesn't say that now that you know these things, you'll be blessed because you know them. That's kind of how sometimes we view Christianity. Now, Christianity takes a couple of forms. It's what you know and what you do. And what you know is important because you have to know the truth. Super important. But what you know should always lead to what you do. What you know should not lead you to do nothing. What you know should lead you to do something, to follow the truth of the scriptures. And Jesus says, now that you know these things, what things? That I'm calling you to serve. I'm calling you to sacrifice. I'm calling you to die to yourself. Because that's what I'm going to do. And when you do, God's going to bless you. Now, blessing doesn't always take the form of material blessings. Now, sometimes we think that, and sometimes people even preach that on TV, that God's going to bless you financially, whatever. And I hope He does. But a lot of times the blessing is His presence. A lot of times the blessing is seeing God work in your life. A lot of times the blessing is people getting saved, people finding hope, marriages being restored, lives being put back together, all because of one simple act of service. Each week, I'm surrounded by people that get there early, that stay late. Some show up at six o'clock in the morning, do things, clean up, make things look good, all in the name of Jesus, with the hope of, by their service, somebody will find Christ. If you do these things, God's gonna bless you. Let's go wash feet. Let's go serve. If you need help with that, we would love to get with you to find opportunities within the church, outside the church. Love to help you take that next, next step. But make no mistake, Jesus is calling. Go serve.